Thank you. I'm Julie Berman, your Director of Faith Formation. And today we have a wonderful service in store. But before we start that, I need someone to come up and open our Wonder Box. And I know you all helped me last week, which was fantastic. But I'm wondering, is there any other? Sadie, would you like to come up? Is that OK if we give Sadie a chance? Come on up, Sadie. Thanks for helping. Oh, and bringing her better brother, Ben. Good morning. Wait, do you want to say hi and who you are to the congregation? Um, hi, um, I'm Sadie Zinke. Yes. I'm Benjamin Mitchell. Thanks. And these are um, the children of Reverend Anastasia Zinke. Yes. All right. Can you hold it? Ben, you know what that is? You might be a little bit little. Question and thumb up. Question mark. Yes. Thanks for holding that up so well. Thanks for helping us. Will you prop it up here so we can look at it for the rest of the service? Thanks, Ben and Sadie. And um, I, you know, this service will be having the opportunity to ask our ministers questions that are on our hearts right now or in our minds. And I was just thinking as I was here, I was like, oh, that's a great quality of being a Unitarian Universalist, that we value questioning. But I also want to say that I just think it's a really natural part about being a human. As I got to start out the service with my six-year-old and 10-year-old next to me, I think I've received 35 questions so far about why are we being quiet right now and those police officers. So um, I just think questioning is a very natural thing to do, and I love that it's encouraged in our faith. So, Lucia, do you want to start us out? We're going to start out with a young person's question. Come on up. Just don't ask, are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> so you can turn around and introduce yourself and then ask your question. My name is Lucia Berman, and my question is, what is God? What is God? Well, uh, Lucia, where are, where are you going? Small question. <laughs> let's, let's, Big answer. Let's, ask, let's hear you answer that real quick. Where's that microphone? Let's, let's hear what your perspective is, which is just as good as ours. I don't know. <laughs> All right, fair enough. You named several people's answers. That's yeah, about a third of the congregation. Are you looking at me? Well, I thought I'd give you a first go. Um, well, if you put two, add an O to the word God, then what do you have? Ah, so that for me is my analogy of God. Uh, God would be all that is good, and uh, I don't believe in like God that has a, a you know white face and a white beard and as a person more of like energy, good energy, uh, although it contains all energy, but it's but it it most it balances. Uh, itself by um, now I'm getting confusing um, <laughs> but let's go back to being good energy and uh, and we all have that in us so in, in essence we're all little gods right we all, we all have that good energy that we can use inside of us does that help ish <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll give it a go. Yeah. So last week I shared um, in my sermon, I think you were maybe doing something else really wonderful, that um, there's, of course, different communities who have different answers to this question. And there's often a community answer and a personal answer. And sometimes those line up and sometimes they don't. But one... Um, one community's answers for pantheism, which stands for God is all things, in all things, and between all things. So kind of like God is in you and me and in our feelings towards one another. Um, and kind of looking at the majesty and mystery of how 
life keeps coming and dying and coming and dying, it's in that process of coming and dying, that God is just existence. And one of the things that we comprehend in life is if God is existence, God is bigger and grander than we could ever imagine. Because there's whole universes out there that we don't even, or whole galaxies out there that we don't even know anything about. But God is also in the little plant that's growing outside your house that stretches towards the sun. And God is in the rain. So God is all of that. And then there's a wonderful, um, Glenn Thomas Rideout is a minister as well as a musician, right? Yeah, yeah. Glenn Thomas Rideout says, God is at least a verb. <laughs> God is at least a verb. And actually, it's so funny because I went somewhere when you said add an O, God add an O at the end, go do. Ah. Go do. And I think about that, God being a verb in us and in all life, go do, go live, go explore, go create the goodness. So I, um, I think... Sometimes I don't love the word God because in Western cultures and in the Western religious traditions of the Abrahamic faith, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, God is a singular, God is a man, God is, has a characteristic with a particular character history, but the rest of the world does not hold God like that. Some of the world doesn't believe in God. Some hold that there's actually God in many forms. So using the word God here, I feel like puts God in a very small box. But I like to say, I don't know a word in English that is bigger than God, right? It's the biggest word I know. And I just think we need to give God that term a little wiggle room to fit the whole universe and all existence and all goodness and all love in and then leave a lot of space for additional mystery and wonder. Does that help? Yeah. All right. Yes. Thank you. Start out with a good one. <laughs> Thanks, that ministers. Was a good one. <laughs> um, so now I'll invite our children and youth to head outside and downstairs with me while we continue to ask questions and while our congregation continue, continues. can't take the singing out of John. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't wait to sing, I'm going to tell you. Um, if you haven't figured out the theme of the service today, it is to question. Good job. So um, one of the things that I have heard as a minister um, from that people have shared with me about some of the traditions that they grew up in and was shared with me was a great deal of pain was when they went to their childhood houses of faith and they would question things. Well, is God supposed to be doing that thing of like wiping out all the people on earth? Or, well, where did all the other people come from? Or what about this? They were kind of shushed. And some of them were told, um, we don't question here. We listen and accept the teachings. and being told to turn off their curiosity, their wonder, their thinking, their common sense was a deep pain point for them. And one of the things that they appreciate about Unitarian Universalism is we actually say, please turn those things on. <laughs> please keep them on to help guide you, make you curious, be your inner teacher, to help us as a community ask the right questions to make sure that we're making decisions with discernment and thoughtfulness and input. So to question is at the very nature of our faith. It's the, it's the culture that we exist in that holds and helps um, the becoming of us as Unitarian Universalists and helps the becoming of Unitarian Universalism. So, um, it's actually kind of a wonderful sort of summer tradition in many congregations to do a question box sermon. It's a really wonderful re-entry for ministers as they're kind of coming back from summer leave periods or getting started for the year, and it really honors our faith. So today, um, some of you have sent in questions to Karen. Um, so on your behalf, she's gonna ask us some questions. 
So John, the first question is for you. Uh, a number of people are interested in hearing about what you've been doing for the last four months on your sabbatical. Nothing. <laughs> and everything. Uh, I rested, uh, but I will talk more about this next Sunday. Um, I've never had that much time to myself in my entire life. So there were some ups and downs. Uh, I read a lot. I prayed, I meditated, I practiced the uh, vagus nerve meditation quite a bit. Um, I went to therapy, and I've made some discoveries about myself, about this ministry, about humanity, and I will be, be sharing them with you. Thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I wish every human being could have that opportunity, uh, a paid time to reflect. I think all human beings deserve that, but uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Uh, it has changed me uh, a lot for the better, and um, I haven't spoken much. I haven't talked a lot, so I'll try not to get too carried away. Thank you. The next question is, how can we overcome the seemingly inability for all of us in this city and county to know the story of interdependence and interconnectedness and treat each other with the dignity and love that I keep hearing about at UUCA. What role does UUCA have in this? That's who we are. That is our role, right? Um, to live it in the micro, in ourselves, and to, uh, to help it manifest in the macro. We don't know oftentimes the impact that we have, right? We live in such very short existences. We don't know the work that we, what the work we do, what kind of impact it will, will have. Sometimes we're a bit short-sighted in wanting to see results next week or in our lifetime. There will be suffering. There is no pleasure without pain. That is just the karmic cycle of it all. What we're experiencing in this time, in my estimation, is a sort of catching up of the trauma and agony that people of color all over this world have felt. And so white people now are feeling that pain, feeling that fear, fear feeling that scarce, scarcity, feeling it all. And for us to heal as a nation, humanity must feel that pain, not just some select minoritized group. Welcome to the club. And I would say yes and to John, which is um, part of that question was like, how can people know the story of interdependence and connection and yet not treat each other like that was true? And I want to say, first of all, not everyone really knows that story. There's a lot of other ideologies and thinking out there that there's a chosen people, that there's one way uh, to uh, make it to um, belonging or heaven or redemption or mattering, that uh, some people and cultures have more worth than others. That's some, and, and some genders and languages, that's, around us all the time. And in fact, way more than the messages of um, we are deeply connected. What holds us is relationship and love. And so part of what we do is try to get that message amplified. And I think we do this, um, we speak about love and connection um, because it needs to be heard, but also because um, that is the wisdom of our faith. And when we go out in the world and we see the cruelty and oppression and harm and all the isms that exist and, and just meanness, we have to ask ourselves, what do we want to center in our being? What helps us stay people of integrity? And we want to have the little voice that says, 
love, kindness, mercy, justice seeking. We want those messages to come because um, I think most of us here want to live those things as who we are. So we do it for ourselves, for our own moral nature. And then finally, um, because we believe acting out of those actually has power. I was sharing, um, I've shared this, com this story with this congregation in the past, but um, there was a day, maybe about four or five years ago, and I had been in some not that important meeting in an interfaith group of clergy and lay leaders, um, and I had mentioned at this legislative meeting that Planned Parenthood provided really invaluable healthcare services, particularly to low-income people besides abortions. And so Planned Parenthood was a valuable resource um, healthcare center. And uh, there was a Catholic priest among those gathered, and turns out that our interfaith group, which is kind of like ACT here, um, because I said this in a meeting, our interfaith group almost lost 40% of their funding and all their office space. And they were like, you have three days to move out. So I got called a lot. And people were like, you need to show up in four days and apologize. Like, you need to retract this. And I got call after call after call. And um, there was a small group of clergy there, mostly men. And, um, and what, there was two women two queer women, one of whom was the executive director of this interfaith um, mobilizing group, who was a Jewish queer white woman. And um, as I, I was a few minutes late from dropping my kid off at daycare and I arrived and the clergy lead was like, great, so we all agreed that we're never gonna talk about um, abortion, Planned Parenthood, or gay marriage ever again. And I sat down and I'm thinking like, we're five minutes in and we've already like solved everything. Like, we, like in my mind, we were just getting, we would just be getting into the check-in, right, on UU time. And, um, and I, I felt they kept on talking about like why none of these things could come up. And one of them said, you know, it's kind of okay if someone on the side mentions something about gay marriage, but like um, no one should like no clergy person in this group should ever say anything together. And the night before I'd counseled a congregant who um, was a young gay man in Indiana and um, he was 18 and three years before he'd been beaten and left and on these train tracks and one of his attackers said, uh, like, what should we do? And the other one said, let's let the train finish him off. Mm. And um, I was thinking about this at this meeting, and I was getting really angry, and I was thinking about this executive director, her name is Shoshana, and if she was killed, would these clergy men around me who had been working with her for seven years, would they go to her funeral? She had organized in their congregations, would they lift up her name in prayer? And, um, and they basically said, okay, great, we're gonna do this and we're never gonna do that. And I had to really question like, can I stay in this group? Can we continue to work together? Is this ethic control? Like, where is this gonna get us? And I had to really go to my core as a Unitarian Universalist and say, everything in history and in science and in my faith says, we are interconnected, we are interdependent, and our relationships with one another matter. And Shoshana had seen this. There had been deep resistance to having a Jewish organizer among many of these Christian leaders, and yet they came to love her and respect her and let her speak in her, their churches. She had seen movement there. And so I was like, huh, I bet, you know, it's not that things are gonna be a full 180, but I can't imagine we can't, if we continue to deeply show up and work together and know each other and love each other, that this conversation wouldn't look different in 10 years. And so I think about actually when I place a, 
put a high bet with high stakes. I'm going to bet with love and relationship. And so when we go out in the world and we see oh, this and that and that, um, what, what force do you think, what, where do you place your ultimate confidence in the best strategy to meet that? For me, it's, it's love. What happens after we die? So we got God now die or death. You got it. <laughs> I speak with my own authoritative voice for what I believe, not what you believe, of course. And the, the views on this are varied. Uh, I believe in, in a life after death. Um, I believe that we, uh, I would say that, you know, do you remember when you were born? Do, you, do people remember when they die? You don't remember when you're born. Uh, would you remember when you're when you're dead? I sit with that question often, quite uh, actually. I believe that we remember the in between, and I do believe there's an in between space between uh, death and what I believe is reincarnation. I don't spend a lot of time on reincarnation because if I don't remember what happened in a previous life, then you know, what does it matter? Uh, I believe everything regenerates. Uh, everything is patterned and in cycles. Uh, and when you study nature, it's cyclical. So I believe that uh, aspects of who we are come back again and again to grow and to learn. We carry the same characteristics, uh, and each of us is on our own spiritual journey. The, the death world, I, I think that in every night I, uh, as I fall asleep, I say, Spirit, uh, allow me to join with the collective consciousness. And soon after that, I'm out. And uh, I believe we are all one consciousness uh, with many different individuated experiences. And so uh, I believe the uh, spirit world, the death world, uh, after death, you live in your dreams. Um, and, um, and I think for the most part, most of my dreams are really fun. Sometimes I don't want to wake up. And I do have parts of my dreams that are scary, but I find when I face those fears, uh, I have very lucid uh, dreams. Uh, I can sometimes control my dreams. Uh, I remember my dreams, uh, and, uh, and they teach me. Uh, some say that the dreams are connected to all of the archetypes, uh, various archetypes, uh, and that uh, the people you see, the personas, are aspects of yourself. And so uh, when you become lucent, lucent in those dreams, you can actually talk to an aspect of yourself. So uh, I actually look forward to going to sleep at night. I have a hard time falling asleep, but once I'm asleep, I'm asleep. And uh, I go deep in, in my dream. I believe that is where uh, I visited, I visited with my mom. I, I recall at, shortly after her death, uh, I was walking down some steps and I turned, and she was at a card table with some lady I'd never seen before. And I said, Ma. And she said, hey, John, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, what are you doing here? And I just woke up exhilarated from that dream. Uh, I, I, I don't fear death. I, feel, I fear suffering. Uh, I don't fear death. Um, uh, and um, I worry more about life than I do death. <laughs> So, um, but I do believe in eternal life. Uh, so there was something to the Muslims wanting to have 40 virgins. I mean, if that's what you want, I don't know. I have trouble with just managing my one wife. So that's what you, ooh, ooh. I have, uh, uh, mm. yeah, hi, Joan. Um, one, is, one is enough for a, a lifetime. But, uh, loving. Loving, them, yes. So. No, I believe in I believe in life after after death. I went to Bryn Mawr College, so forty virgins is um, very familiar to me. <laughs> I um. I was just talking to about Sadie about this question. She asked me the other day, "What happens when we die?" And I shared um, a little bit what I shared in last week's sermon, which is, um, I look at what happens all around me with stars and with plants and everything, which is, um, holds true with what I know in life, which is uh, 
there is um, an unfolding cycle of creation and destruction. And when that comes to me, like everything else, um, science says we never, we never entirely lose anything, right? Energy goes somewhere, mass becomes, transforms into other mass. And so does that mean that I'm gonna be me after death? Doesn't seem like it. But it doesn't seem like I'm just eradicated either. It seems like I, be, I contribute to the becoming of something else. Um, and, uh, and I like to hold the mystery and curiosity of that. So, um, so I, think, uh, I think there is a great continuum. I would say, um, because it is a mystery to some degree, focusing on this life has been at the heart of Unitarian Universalism. And I wish more people spent time thinking about not what happens when we die, but how would I most, what would a good death mm. or death at its best look like to me mm. and work towards that? Um, and I think each of us can come up with their own true answer and work towards that. I think we can just fit in one more question. Um, none of our questions are small, right? Um, what are the priorities for our congregation for the eighth principle and racial justice? Well, without that, then the seven are just, uh, you know, hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. So um, we voted in the eighth principle some time ago, and I know there was a presentation during our last congregational meeting. I wasn't here. You know, I'm assuming, we're assuming that it is one of our top priorities for this congregation. Uh, it's not just so that we can work toward becoming a more racially diverse congregation. I mean, that's important to me, but, but uh, more important is that we understand what we mean by being an eighth principle congregation. That, you know, we are trying to eliminate oppressions within ourselves and, of course, without. And that includes, uh, you know, our racism and you know, misogyny and all the things that we're managing. Uh, but particularly uh, the issue of white and black, which is the issue of humanity, of othering, of sort of whiteness, othering that which isn't, is something that we have to continue to grapple with. Uh, we will not balance the karma uh, of uh, patriarchy, of maleness, of white supremacy until we grapple with this, right? This is our work individually, collectively. This is the great work. All the other stuff is important too, mm -hmm. but this is the great work of, of managing our superior ideas and beliefs <coughs> over and against ideas <coughs> that we consider to be primitive and finding a way um, uh, to walk in other people's shoes so uh, it is a priority. We have board members who are on the uh, eighth principle implementation team who keep that top of mind. Mm -hmm. I expect uh, some things to happen in the congregation that people can recognize. Mm -hmm. What those things are, I think, are still being figured out. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Um, thank you both for your insights today. And thank you to everybody who submitted questions prior to this Sunday. Um, obviously, we couldn't get to all of your questions, but your ministers are here. And um, please reach out to them um, to answer um, any of the questions you have about our congregation, our community, um, these theological questions that were brought up today. Thanks.